Okay, I think we will start. Yeah. So, welcome to the lecture 7 and I am not surprised that the strength is low because it is advanced statistical course, I mean the lecture, right. So, but uh, I have to finish, so and this today is going to be uh, unofficially the last lecture, right, because we still going to have the practical session later, uh, later in December. So, yeah, sometime. So today we will discuss about the data clustering and the Kruskal values we have already discussed during the ANOVA, right? So I'm not going to discuss that. And then we'll talk about the principal component analysis and the survival modeling, right? The survival analysis. And we will, if time permits, we will talk about the machine learning and the big data terminology, right? In a, in a very brief sense. So uh, before that, I would like to discuss uh, this curve and this is not important for you guys because none of us are doing a randomized controlled trial, right? But this curve has changed the world and has changed the medicine, right? And this is not my uh, wordings, but it is from the, from the Stanford and many people, right? And that, is, that, uh, that curve is called as a kaplan merck curve, right? And you will never find any, any journal which hasn't mentioned uh, this particular curve. And people haven't mentioned actually any, any uh, such kind of curve. Uh, so you will uh, never find any journal which uh, hasn't mentioned uh, kaplan mayer curves. So what is important about kaplan mayer is uh, it tells you about the survival analysis. Whenever somebody does a randomized controlled trial, he has to, or the researchers have to represent the result by the kaplan mayer. Right. And that will tell you whether or not your randomized control trial uh, has, be, has uh, succeed or not. Right. So that's why it is very important. And that's why uh, I thought our statistical course will not be complete without uh, you know, understanding the kaplan uh, curve. So we have seen this, uh, the quality of evidence and the amount of information. So as you go upward in this uh, pyramid, uh, you get the more quality of evidence, uh, depending on what kind of study you use it. Right. So this typical uh, curve is related to the randomized controlled trial, okay? So in randomized controlled trial, just to fresh up the uh, memories, so we have this group, for example, then we sample data from it, and then we randomly uh, assign that to the control, uh, control and the treatment, right? And then we have an inv investigator who blindly treats it or intervene to the treatment and the placebo. Okay, if it is placebo, then there is no treatment, right? But it, he is blinded, and that we have seen the blinding and all. But the intervention was given to the treatment, and they, we follow them over time, right? In order to find some event. The event can be disease, or the disappearance of disease, or whatever. The tumor growth has shrinked or enlarged, increased. So this, this is called as an event, right? And this is also called as an endpoint. Okay, so once we understand this, so time to an event, so the survival analysis is only applicable to the study where you have a time to an event analysis. And in randomized controlled trial, we have seen that's a time to event. But we have to understand the censored and uncensored data during the trial. So in case of, uh, so if this is an x-axis, as you can see time. So the trial has started from zero years to 12 years. So it was running. And then we allocate a, a patient here or the volunteer. He start, uh, he's there from the beginning of the trial and it goes until the end of the trial, right? And it, he shows the end point. The end point could be death or the disappearance of disease, right? But there can be some volunteers who may not have started from the beginning of the trial, but they may start from the in between, right? So we have to take care of that also, right? Because it's, if it's a 12 years, then you cannot control everybody to start from the beginning, right? So you have such people uh, where they start in between. Then you have uh, some people who have started in between, but they may not show up at the end of the uh, trial, the outcome. So the outcome, they may show outcome later, but not at the time of the end of the trial, right? So such uh, data point are called as a sensor data point. Some sensor data point would be that they have started from the uh, later phase, but they have just died, for example, right? then you cannot have an ability to, to get the uh, outcome. Or some people have just started and they decided to go out. So that's basically dropout rate, right? So this whole idea is called as a compliance rate of, of your trial. So it is important to find, uh, have the censored, this is called a censored data, this is uncensored data. Okay, once you have a censored, uncensored data, then it's very easy to, to run a Kaplan-Meier. Uh, 
So you see this group here. The group uh, one indicates a treatment and two indicates the placebo, okay? So you are dividing your uh, patients or the whatever the volunteers into the two groups. Time indicates the time to an event. So every, every patient or every volunteer will have a time units. And that time unit indicates how many time units he has gone through until he reached to the end point. That is basically a time point. Number of days or number of, uh, you know, the mortality or whatever you say, the end point. And this remission one means that this guy, this two rows has reached to the end point. And this third one hasn't reached to the end point. That's why it's a zero. That's a remission rate, right? So you just need to know, this is called as uncensored data, this is censored data, kind of, yeah? So you just need this three information, three column. And then you just uh, give it to the uh, software like uh, MedCalc or whatever, then MATLAB also, it's very easy. And then you can compute uh, this kaplan mayer curve. What it will tell you, uh, the, the y-axis is the survival probability, okay? The probability of survival, so as you can see from the start of the trial, everyone has 100% survival uh, probability. But as the trial goes on, some people just got, uh, you know, they, they just died. Because of, because of the disease, because of the outcome, right? And the rate of this survival, you can sh sh uh, see it from this plot. That is called as a Kaplan-Meier uh, survival plot. And it, as you can see, the group one was the treatment and the group two was a placebo, you see here? So at certain point of time, there was a plateau here for the, for the placebo, uh, for the treatment. Then you can see that uh, there, there is a certainly an advantage of having a treatment over the placebo because the survival rate hasn't gone that down as compared to the, the placebo, right? So this is, the, this is what uh, the everybody's, uh, uh, whenever you do a clinical trials, this is what you want to see at the end of the trial, right? And this is why this curve is so important for all pharmaceutical industries and those who are doing the epidemiology and the statistics. Uh, but then how, how can I say that these two plots are statistically different, right? And for that, there is something called as a log rank test. And the software will calculate for that. And as long as the p-value is significant, we can say that the treatment survival uh, probability over time for the treatment is statistically different than having no medicine or no treatment. Then you can claim that it is statistically different. There is something called as a hazard ratio, okay? Because if you read uh, literature, you might see this hazard ratio, uh, even if they are not uh, mentioning about the controlled trials. But what is hazard ratio? Hazard ratio is nothing but the probability of the relative risk of a, one group versus another group. So here you can see the group two, which is the placebo. So you can see that the, the probability of having risk of having this event is four times more as compared to the treatment, right? So let's say if the mortality rate, if, I, if you, the end point is a mortality, then the mortality is four times more in placebo as compared to the treatment. That one we can say, right? Uh, and which is a reverse in, in case of uh, the uh, hazard ratio for group one. And as long as the confidence interval does not include one, you can confidently say that this treatment, if somebody repeat this experiment again, or uh, repeat this trial somewhere else, it is very unlikely to find uh, anything more than one because the confidence interval does not include one, right? So treatment is always better than the placebo in this clinical trials. So this is how you interpret the result from the kaplan mayer right? Okay, but this is just a randomly I picked up uh, this example just to show you, and this is not published in, uh, well, it's a New England Journal of Medicine. This is a basic uh, publication, but this was published in this uh, uh, Nature Clinical uh, Cardiovascular Medical uh, Research, uh, Cardiovascular Medicine. So here the aldactone is the name of the medicine in market. And that's a spironolactone. That's basically a, a treatment. That's a chemical, right? And this is, they have shown in this paper, the Kaplan-Meier graph to show that the, how the spironolactone was efficient in treating the cardiovascular disease, heart failure rate, as compared to the placebo, as compared to not having any medicine at all, right? And the p-value was significant. So, you will never find any medicine or any, any medicine that you're taking who have not gone through the Kaplan-Meier curves. That's why it is very important, right? Uh, there is something called as a Cox regression, okay? 
that is also related to the survival analysis. So whenever you have a time to an event data, one can regress. We have seen logistic regression, right? And we have seen how one can correlate many different parameters to one event. And that event can be yes or no, or it can be continuous. We have seen that in logistic regression and in the linear discriminant analysis, right? So, and linear modeling. But in case of the Cox regression, how it is different, uh, it is also called as a proportional hazard regression. So we will come back to the proportional later. But the Cox regression, how it is different than any other regression that we have learned, is it is very specialized for the time to an event output. So we cannot apply logistic regression or any other regression on the time to an event. And the time to an event is basically, so the Cox regression allows analyzing the effect of this several risk factors on the survival. Yeah, so, so the, uh, this is my time to an event. Let's say the mortality rate, or for example, the recurrence of the disease or the, or the death, for example. I can model that based on the risk factors. Yeah, because my output is the time to an event, and this is my risk factors. So I can actually know what is the risk of dying because of the cardiovascular disease if the input predictors like the alcohol consumption, weight, BMR, or whatever, right? So you can basically model the Cox regression on that. Uh, and this is where you use the Cox regression, right? So the difference between the Co kaplan mayer and Cox regression is that the kaplan mayer methods use a log rank test in order to compare between the two curves survival, while in case of the Cox regression, you only allows analyzing the several effect factors on the survival, right? So it's a regression model, but the kaplan mayer is when you want to compare between the two survival time to an event data set. The kaplan mayer survival analysis can run only on the categorical predictor, while the Cox regression can work on both categorical and continuous because it's a regression, right? And the kaplan mayer is a non-parametric procedure where the Cox regression is a semi-parametric uh, uh, method, procedure. So whenever you have a time to an event data, I can't say that a, you, you will never have time to an event data if you're not doing a randomized control trial. But let's say you're tracking a cell, for example. You can apply Kaplan-Meier. I, I don't know if that is a good idea, but this is not limited to the randomized control trial. Whenever you have a time to an event, let's say you, you, you track a lineage of the cell, start from the one time point, and you have collected such events in a one data set, and you want to compare the, such event with respect to another data set, or another group, for example, you can use kaplan Meyer. right? So it's a good idea, actually, to, uh, to have this project, because I just, that idea just came into my mind. I had never seen any kind of kaplan Meyer applying on the cell tracking, okay? But you can use it. So then we can, uh, let's go for this machine learning, okay? Let's understand what is machine learning. Well, machine learning is not, not a topic which can be covered in 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Well, machine learning is, is a, these days, is a big topic, right? Um, and machine learning is a abbreviation, I would say, or it is basically a common terminology, or you can say it's a discipline of a computer science which deals with artificial intelligence, uh, computational learning, pattern recognition, predictive analytics, or the statistical learning theory. So it is just all the synonyms, right? They are all come in a one package. That's a computer science. And why machine learning is important in this lecture is because machine learning cannot work without statistics. So the statistical learning theory was evolved over the period of time, and now they, people call that as a machine learning. But actually, it's a statistics, yeah? So machine learning is a subfield of a computer science that gives the computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And this is what the Arthur Samuel says in 1959. And now we started realizing the, the implications of machine learning in day-to-day -day life, right? So <clears throat> what does it mean that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed is like that. So I have this example, which we have been using uh, across our lecture series. And then I want to define them. So, I, I, so my task is basically to find and characterize the human, animal, and the plates. Okay, this is the object recognition task. What people have been doing so far, up until 1980s or 60s or whatever, they, they used to write a program, right? That if the average height of the object is more than 200 pixels, then it's a human, less than 20 pixels, animal, 
<laughs> shape is square, then it's a 96 well plate, right? And then you used to get, and it's not like completely bad idea. You used to get a nice result, but that wasn't that fancy. That wasn't innovative. Because the moment you change the illumination of this plate, or illumination of this uh, image, this program, hard-coded characteristics, will not work for that particular. So this is called as the hard uh, programming, right? But what is machine learning? The machine learning is you extract features, and your features, you extract such feature which is uh, insensitive to the variations of the intensity, illumination, or whatever the you know, focus or defocus things. And then you build a machine learning algorithm on that. And that would detect uh, human animals and plates more accurately as compared to the previous one. So this is what the machine learning is about, actually. Yeah? OK, let's see the more example. So my, uh, in machine learning, especially for the supervised machine learning, there is a terminology called the training data. So you have to train your machine. You have to feed your machine with some training levels. And now my task here is that the humans and animal, I want to, uh, I want to build a machine which would be able to detect the human versus the animal, right? And there I have collected the samples from the humans and the animals, and then I, I build a machine learning algorithm, right? that the output of machine learning algorithm will be a model. And that model will have all the knowledge from this training data. So in future, if I get an image, then that image will be detected as a human, right? And the reason I just put is he's a superhuman, right? I, I like him, so. Okay, but this is, and this phase is called as a training phase, and this is called as a test phase, okay? And this is a part of supervised machine learning. We're gonna see that now. So if you see machine learning algorithm, they have been broadly classified into supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and also the reinforcement learning. This is a terminology people have been using in past 10 years. It wasn't there, actually. In fact, it wasn't there when I was doing my PhD in computer science. Not that much. So we have been told only supervised and unsupervised. So supervised learning, artificial neural network, Bayesian statistics, random forest, linear discriminant analysis, nearest neighbor classifier, Super vector machine, logistic regression. We have seen this in this class, right? So we have seen supervised machine learning. These are just the technique in the supervised machine learning algorithm. Then in case of unsupervised, the clustering, self-organizing map, model-based vector quantization. But what does it mean supervised? Supervised, we just seen an example. Whenever there is a training and test, that's called as a supervised. You are supervising your machine based on some known samples. That's called as a supervised machine. In case of unsupervised, you don't train. You just give data to the machine, and machine task is to find some pattern from the data. That's called as unsupervised machine learning. Okay? A reinforcement learning is basically this video is enough to tell you. And you must have heard about deep learning, right? So deep learning is just the subset of the reinforcement learning. And if you see this video, so this, this cute girl, she, she's trying to ride a bicycle, right? She's trying to learn how to ride a bicycle, right? And her mom is teaching her. So that's basically training, right? But it's not only the training what gave her confidence next time to ride a bicycle, but it's also the self-learning. She's also learning by herself. So what she is doing, so whenever she falls, she tries to register what mistake, mistake she had done in past, and next time she will not repeat. So that's basically the, the intelligent way of feedback mechanism, right? And this is the whole essence of deep learning and the reinforcement learning. And uh, eventually, she will, she will ride smoothly without her mom's help and without even falling down. That's basically how uh, the deep learning works. Right? So every time you put a data, it tries, to, it tries to learn by itself and try to correct its mistake in the past. And you must have heard about this news, which was published in Nature also. Yeah. That's the Go. Go is a Chinese, uh, uh, it's a Chinese game, and it has an enormous permutation and combination. It's a very complex game, right? It is beyond the human interventions. I mean, that's basically a, a, a one human cannot understand all the moves, like a chase, for example. Yeah, it, it has an enormous permutation and combination. But uh, they have built a deep neural network machine, and that competed with a, with a Go expert and he won. I mean, the machine outperformed than the, than the expert. And that was a big news. And there, people started realizing, yes, artificial neural network is really coming. 
or artificial intelligence is really coming, right? Because we will discuss why there was a phase where artificial intelligence, all the movies like artificial intelligence and the robotics, iRobots came and then there was a phase of 10 years. People say that we are not able to achieve the robotics, but now people started realizing after this news of deep learning, right? And why we will discuss this. So, but before that, I uh, would like to uh, discuss the clustering thing, okay? First we'll finish, then we'll come back to that. So the clustering, the clustering has been divided into hierarchical clustering, is also called as a linkage-based clustering, and also the partition, uh, the second uh, classification is the partition-based. And in the hierarchical clustering is further classified into agglomerative strategy and the divisive strategy, okay? What is the agglomerative strategy? Agglomerative strategy is, as name indicates, what it does is it first divides your data set into small sub data set, right? And then try to find a similarity between the different chunks of the data. Like for example, in this case, A, B, C, D has been divided initially to the very extreme phase of division. And then with some similarity of the adjacency, right? You try to collect and make as a, make as a cluster. And you ultimately boils it down to the one object. That's basically main cluster. That's the agglomerative approach. So from many to one, that's the agglomerative approach. And the divisive is like a reverse of that, from one to many, right? You go and then find a cluster like this. But this is not that innovative, right? I mean, I hardly, I hardly use this strategy in my whole uh, career. What is interesting is the second part, the partition. And there is uh, two uh, subcategories called the exclusive strategy and the probabilistic strategy in the partitioning clustering, right? In exclusive strategy, we have a minimum spanning tree algorithm. We have a k-means, you must have heard, and then k-medoid, right? And then the probabilistic, this is a bit um, up-to-date field in the clustering, as far as clustering is concerned. It's called as a, uh, the Gaussian mixture modeling, the fuzzy Siemens, Gustav and Kessel, Gatsheva. We're gonna see that, what does that mean and what is the implication of this algorithm on the data set, okay? So these are the what we're going to see. So let's see what is a k-means clustering. So the first window, these gray dots are the data points. And the, what k-means does is, the k-means is uh, not completely unsupervised. It asks user to, find, uh, to put a number of clusters to start with, right? So we have to, we have to give the k-means clustering that, okay, randomly uh, I want the number of clusters like three clusters. So what k-means does, k-means randomly put the cluster points anywhere, randomly, on the data set, okay? And this is the beauty of the cluster, uh, the, the algorithm will start. So what it does is, for every data points, every data points, it will find a distance to every other clusters, cluster points, okay, initial points. So every data point will have a three distance in this case. And then you assign that data point to the cluster where the distance is shortest. Makes sense, right? So for example, this data, this distance was smaller than this distance and that distance, right? That's why it has given that cluster. And such way, uh, in, in such way, you create this Veronoid tessellation. This is called a Veronoid tessellation, thanks. But this is just the one iteration of the algorithm. Then what you do is, go to the next phase, in next state, you forget about this point, the, the initial cluster point. You try to generate the new cluster point based on the group that already been established. So what do you compute? You compute the mean value of all these samples from here, then that would be a new uh, initial point, likewise. And you, then you repeat again the procedure, like finding a distance of every point to these clusters. And then, uh, like for example, in these two green points, are now more closer to the new initial point as compared to the old one. That's why it becomes one cluster now, right? And you repeat this procedure again and again, again and again, until there is no change of assignment from one data point to the cluster point, and then you stop there. That is a maximum, that is a convergence of the algorithm, right? That's basically k-means clustering. Then there is something called as a k-medoid clustering, so the only difference with the k-medoid is that at this stage, whenever you try to find a new cluster point, of course you're gonna find the mean, uh, mean uh, cluster point based on these samples, but you do not give that mean point as an initial uh, point. 
but you try to find the point from the data itself which is near to that point. That's called as a chimeroid, right? That is the only difference. That's it. Interesting is the fuzzy CMS clustering. And this has been uh, developed by uh, Dunn and uh, Bezdek uh, from 1970 through 1981. And it is frequently used in pattern recognition, right? The fuzzy, fuzzy C clustering or fuzzy CMS clustering. What is it? This is a formula which we're not going to see at all. Uh, but let's say, imagine the, you have a one dimensional points here, right? On X axis, because it is easy to illustrate, right? Then you can clearly see that if I ask you, uh, where do you wanna put your cluster points? Of course, you're gonna put cluster point one here and another one here, right? Because it, there is very crowded here, there. So of course, uh, with what I would do, that's, that's what the k-means would do. The k-means would do, it would put A here and the B here, and there is a hard partition, right? So every data point, every data point here will get one or zero, zero or one, one or zero, right? Either they belong to A or either they belong to B. They cannot belong simultaneously, mutually exclusive, right? That is called as a hard clustering. This is what we have been seeing in k-means and the, the k -midoid. But what is a good part of this fuzzy C-means is that we do not have this transition, strong transition, but there is a smooth sigmoid curve. Whenever there is a overlapping of cluster A and cluster B. So that what happens is, even if this guy is belonging to B, it has some membership function or membership value to class A, and that is 20%. So the 80% of this guy belongs to the, uh, the class B, or cluster B, but 20% has a membership to cl cluster A, right? And likewise, you can have, but all these guys which are very extreme, they have a one, right? The probability is one. But probability can never be one and zero. It will be always in between, right, uh, in reality. So basically, the, the every data point will have some membership values, yeah? And this is called as a uh, membership matrix, and this is what is shown in, the, in this uh, equation. And this X is nothing but the individual data points, and the C is nothing but the centers. That's it. And likewise, you can have a probability map, right? Now, for example, I can go for the three cluster now. And the three clusters are not like these three up and down things, but three clusters are very smooth. They are overlapping regions, and that may have some membership values there. That's basically the fuzzy CMS clustering. Okay, then let's see some advanced uh, fuzzy clustering algorithm. That's called as a Gustafen Kessel and Gathjeva. So Gustafen Kessel clustering algorithm extend the fuzzy Siemens, is basically based on fuzzy Siemens, but then uh, it employs the adaptive distance norm. I don't want to go into detail because that's, I'm not able to give you an, uh, a, a possible explanation about this one to, with your comprehension because it's, it's a bit, a lot of mathematical things, right? It's just that it uses the, instead of Euclidean distance, it tries to adapt itself based on the data, right? That's basically very, uh, I would say, more intelligent way of doing fuzzy Siemens. That's the Gustav and Kessel. Well, uh, and also it is important that it also look for the different geometrical shape. It is not only the, the clustering, but also look for the geometrical, which we, we're, gonna, we're gonna see the example, right? Then the second one is the Gathjeva clustering, which uses the distance norm based on the fuzzy maximum likelihood estimate. Again, this is something beyond uh, the, uh, the scope of this class. <laughs> Uh, because it, 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 it depends on the maximum likelihood estimation, but it's also the fuzzy maximum likelihood estimation, right? But again, it is more fancy, you can say, more advanced. And if you want to uh, explore more, there, there's a toolbox called the Fuzzy Clustering and Data Analysis Toolbox in MATLAB. Yes? Yeah, um, on yes. Here, this is just a... Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is just the geometrical interpretation. This is not how it works, actually, because I wanted to compare it. This is how it works, actually. This is what is the key K means, you see? This is a, there is a line here. I was talking about this line, that line. So basically, this line and this line and that line are very hard line, right? And this is what it means, this hard line, that one. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, you're right that the outcome of all the clustering uh, algorithms based on how you initialize your starting points. But as long as you have an iterations, maximum number of iterations, or at least the optimal number of iterations, that should not matter. Minima, maxima, exactly. We, we, I'm going to talk about that because this is a very important point. And whenever I see in the lectures, they only talk about the k-means and k-medoid, uh, right? But I have a slide which will tell you how to choose optimal cluster before, right? And then that time I will tell you how to decide which cluster point and what uh, clustering algorithm is important for your data set, yeah? Yes, exactly. So, so let's go for the example. I think that's more intuitive. So the clustering example, I have this example. And it's just a two dimension, y and x. And then I start initialization with k equal to 4. This is the output of k-means. So it has taken this as a one class, another class. This is your uh, answer to your question. So for example, this green guy here, even if it is close to the yellow one, it still is a color is green as compared to this one. So there is no distinguish between how close they are with their own centers. That's basically hard clustering, right? And this is what has been taken care by the fuzzy seamings, that even if they are in one class, that's fine. But if this guy, this green point, if it is close to the center, it has more membership function of this class as compared to this class. This is the output of k-medoid, and as you can see, the, the output of k-medoid, the cluster centers, are at the data points. That's, that's the difference, you see? Because in k-means, the data point can be anywhere. That's the optimization algorithm, right? It tries to find the mean of that particular class, and then the, that, that's the new starting point. And then it iterates again and again and again. But in k-medoid, it is always ensure that the, the cluster data uh, cluster center would be at the one of the data point, yeah? But this is not uh, very innovative, right? Because you can see that this is not how the clustering should work, because looking at just data. I mean, I would say this will be one cluster, this will be another cluster, and this will be another cluster, right? So that's just the output of the hard clustering. And then we're gonna see uh, the, the beauty of fuzzy Siemens. This is the fuzzy Siemens algorithm. Same data set, but you applied the fuzzy Siemens, and then you try to find this as a one class instead of two classes here. This is a one class, this another, this one, and this one. And it's not only the class, but as what you see, this contour line indicates the probability of mem like membership functions of individual cluster, right? For example, this yellow one, the yellow has more membership function for this particular class than this contour. So this contour has uh, some membership function which was shared with this cluster, this cluster, and that cluster, right? This is why we call it a soft clustering because one members can have a membership function for all the, class, all the clusters, right? It's just that how much you have to decide, okay? The Gustafen Kessel, look at the beauty of the Gustafen Kessel, that it tries to find the shape on the structure within the data, right? So it's not only the clustering, but it tries to find there is a linear structure, okay, I should cluster them likewise, and there is also a linear structure here, so cluster them likewise, and this one, and this one. So that's, that's more advanced, that's more intelligent way of doing clustering, right? Not just simply looking at the data x, y, and Euclidean distance. And the same thing with, you see this Gatijeva. It's again more beautiful because it's very, uh, very strict and it's very also fuzzy at the same time, right? So it's try to find the same structure, but it's very, um, very cohesive in that way, right? Very coherent. Okay. But this is uh, maybe your answer to your question. So how to choose the number of clusters? Right? Because you always have to start with some numbers and then how to choose a random such numbers, right? But let's take this example. This is just a synthetic data. So I know a priori that there are six numbers, cluster numbers here. So I would expect 
the algorithm should give me, if, if that algorithm is smart enough, that should tell me the optimal cluster, algor uh, cluster should be six. So there are some uh, papers and some research works only based on the validity of the cluster, clustering algorithm. And that's called the z Bailey index, Dunn index, and there are partition index, the classification entropy, and all. There, are, there are so many features, actually, by which you can evaluate the uh, efficiency of your clustering algorithms. And as you can see here, this is the cluster number of clusters. This is a performance. And uh, of course, the cluster will not start from one. It will start from two, right, two to 10. So I just programmically, I said that try to find the cluster centers and this performance from two to 10. And they have just plotted this uh, plot. And you can see at six, there the done index has the highest value. So we just without knowing the data, just by looking at this done index, I would first initialize the sixth number of uh, uh, cluster centers, right? And the, the, the point of your answer is that where to put it, that cluster, as long as you have enough uh, iteration, that should not matter, right? But it is not guaranteed that next time in your computer, if you rerun this program, there will be a little bit of fluctuation, but not that much, okay? Because every system has a random number generator, things. So there are some techniques by which you can put a particular seed, right? In MATLAB, you can store that. And then it is ensure that every time you generate this, you will have result, same result. But this is how you should uh, optimize the cluster number. OK? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is just an alternative. And here you can see, you see, that the Z and Bene is increasing. So from 6, there is a plateau, there is a constant. And then it starts going down. But you have to see the scale at which it varies. OK? So it is not a very definitive approach. It is not a very definitive approach. And I'm going to come to a uh, slide where you can have a four and six, and what is the difference between four and six? But you, the, uh, people have been using Dunn index, but again, it depends on the data. What kind of data you have? Because that's that's uh, the people say it's a curse of dimensionality, but I would say curse of the type of data, because machine learning is still a data-driven process. So you cannot just put the same algorithm on the different data set and you'll not expect the good result because it has to tune their parameter based on the data, right? So that's why. But uh, you can try different approaches, different validation indexes, and then get, get some rough sense how much should be or how many clusters should, should I initiate with, right? Let's take this example. That's from the Claudia Lucas group. So I have a genes. So 36 genes are there on the 96 well plate. And the three features have, have been extracted. Yeah, and one of them is 53BP1, the um, H2X, and uh, the EDU. And I think you know better than me, that's 53BP1, H2X, these are the just mitotic uh, DNA damage, right? That's a marker for that. And the EDU is a DNA replication marker, right? And so whole idea is that, can I categorize the genes based on these three features? Right? That, that was a goal, basically. So one can do this uh, simple thing. One can plot one feature by every other feature in 2D plot. But that is not possible, right? Because you can clusterize this guy here on this dimension, but that would completely change in the another dimension. So is there any way that I can see at instant or at the same time all the three dimension and try to divide the data into high dimension? That's basically the goal. And there we have to discuss about the principal component analysis, right? So what does it do? So just for example, x-axis and y-axis, you have these data points. Let's say it's a weight and this is a height, for example, and this is the individual data point. And we have seen in a correlation that I can say it's a linearly correlated, right? What PCA does, PCA does, does some mathematical um, analysis or formulation which transform a correlated variables into a smaller number of uncorrelated variables. So it tries to find in which direction there is a variance, there is a, there is a variation in which direction. That direction can be considered a principal component. So it only cares about the where there is a variance, which dimension there is a variance. 
And he, you can see the output of the PCA, that this is a PCA, principal comp first principal component, second principal component. And then you see, if you just know only the principal, first principal component, you see the variability here. You see, there is a variability. And in the principal component two, there is no variability as such. So what you can do, that, so what, what was the whole point here? The point here is that if you just look at the PC1, you would be able to carry all the variation in the data. And you can completely ignore the principal component two. And this is the whole logic of data compression. Like whenever you save your data into JPEG format, and when you wonder that why the size has reduced, is because of this one, yeah? Of course, they use a discrete cosine transform, but the, the whole logic is this one. They, they try to map your data, what a human eye can see, into some subspace where one cannot even comprehend and try to find which components are important and just remove uh, all other components, right? So this is basically principal component analysis. Okay, let's take an example quickly just to get an idea of a PCA. So this is just a, one example where, uh, depending on the regions, there is a food habits. So England, North Island, Northern Ireland, uh, Scotland, and Wales. Yeah, and these are the different eating habits in that population or that region. So the question is, can I, uh, can I um, differentiate one region as compared to others? One cannot, because if this had been only two uh, features, I would have plotted actually an X and Y. And I got to know that, okay, this is the region, right? But now the number of features are huge, like I mean, as compared to three, it's, it's many, right? Like more than 10. So it is not possible to plot uh, that 10 features on the, on the computer. So the PC will help you. What PC will do, PC will take all this 10 dimension, or 10 or whatever, and try to put it in an only two dimension. In such a way that the first principal component and second principal component, which carries the maximum variation in the data, right? And then here you can see that the northern islands are, are a bit outward, right? They are different than these three regions. And that you, you can then go back and see, okay, why is that? Is because of maybe the, the fresh food consumption, fresh fruit consumption in Northern Ireland is less as compared to others. And also the fresh potatoes is more as compared to the others. Yeah, and that's why the Northern Islands are completely different than other region. But this is the, the, the application of PCA, yeah? Uh, in your case, you can have a different uh, groups, different sample size, samplers, and then you can apply PCA and see how they're different. <clears throat> Coming back to this example that we were discussing about, I tried to first, my first procedure was to find the optimal cluster center, right? Because I cannot just start with two, three, four, five. But I just started from two to 10, thinking that 10 should be enough, right? And then this is the done index. As you can see, the done index was maxima two. So it's not that intuitive. I think coming back to your answer, right? It is not that intuitive. What do you have to do? Because if somebody has to just rely on the done index, the optimal clustering would be two. So that's the maximum, right? But then it, that is because there is one cluster here and there is one cluster here. So there's a maximum separation, right? But one has to then apply a certain logic, right? Which needs to be driven by the data, right? That you expect, let's say, roughly four or five. And then you can see here that, okay, with, uh, if, if, it, if it goes to four, then the reduction in the done index is not that much. It's little, right? then it, you can afford to have four clusters until the sixth one. So you can afford to have a six number of clusters if you want to have variability and you want to show or divide your genotype into six different groups. But of course you cannot go to the seven and eight and all these things. But again, it depends on how much accuracy and the compromise you want to do. But uh, this is the result using the Gathejeva clustering. And you see these are the four clusters. This is the result using the six clusters, okay? And this is the PCA projection. It's not the real data, because real data, we have seen the dimension was three, right? Now the three dimension has been reduced to two, and that is the first principle, second principle component. So you can apply fuzzy clustering of the high dimensional data using PCA. I mean, you, cluster, you do clustering using fuzzy clustering, but then you map your data using PCA onto 2D to see the visualization, yeah? Okay, and then I just got this uh, result. And then I put it into this, uh, there is a web program which can generate such kind of, uh, you know, the Venn diagram. 
and I had divided into cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, and cluster four. So I, I can divide this unique 36 genes into four cluster family, right? And come to know that there are 16 such genes which are expressed everywhere, I mean, in all the four groups. And there are some who are just not expressed only in that particular cluster. So that's basically the outcome that you can get from the clustering, right? Okay, and then we have time to discuss uh, quickly about deep learning. We have seen actually the video of deep learning, right? Just reinforcement learning. But why deep learning, right? So, so if you see this x-axis, that's the amount of data, and that's the performance. So, and the red, red uh, curve shows the older learning algorithms. So this is what we have been doing from, from 1960s, since ever we started uh, discovering the semiconductors and computers and all those things. But there is a convergence. So there is a plateau after a certain amount of data. So algorithm stops working on the huge amount of data. And this phase has come after this, uh, all this uh, IT, internet, right? Because everybody started uh, generating data. And that was a problem for the older algorithms, and this is where it stops. And this is where um, you know, people have saying that the robotics and the artificial intelligence, these are just the dreams, right? It is not going to happen ever. But until the, the deep learning has come, the reinforcement learning. And the good part of de deep learning, reinforcement learning, is that it, it varies as the data varies. So the data is not a big deal for the, for the, learn, for the deep learning, right? Performance increases as the amount of data increases. So it's a linear relationship. That's the beauty of deep learning, right? Okay, uh, and it keeps getting better as you feed them more data. So it's also the, because it's a reinforcement learning, right? And in just uh, one slide, uh, we'll come to know what is deep learning. So this is a traditional pattern recognition. So let's say if I have a, this image of a car, feature extractor, I would extract, uh, people used to extract features like intensity, colors, uh, brightness, and things like that, very nominal features, right? And then you used to train a classifier, and then the classifier was efficient enough to detect the cars. Then the people came to, uh, to idea of the mid-level features, right? Then uh, for extracting features, you will also extract the mid-level features, like the regions and ages and things like that. With the deep learning, what it does is, you can have, you can learn features in many different layers. That's why it is called as a deep learning, right? So for example, you can have a low level features, for example, the spot-like structures, spot-like spot -like features on an image. Then you combine that spot-like features to become age-like structures, right? The combined age-like structures becomes surfaces and shape. Your combined shape becomes surface. Your combined surface becomes a particular object. Likewise, so there is a different hierarchy on the level of the features. And this is the beauty of deep learning, right? So uh, this is all about deep learning, yes. Then I want to talk uh, about the big data, yeah? So big data, uh, how, how many of you have heard of uh, big data? Yeah, okay, yes, two, that's good. Okay, but big data you're gonna hear more and more. And actually, indirectly, you, you are using big data and, and deep learning in the background. So whenever you search in Google about what is the temperature, or what is the, the next uh, bus coming for a particular location, that is basically deep learning, right? Or what is the traffic for this particular route today, right? It is because the input by many sensors in real time, right, given to the Google headquarters, and Google have reinforced their map for a Copenhagen in particular city for a particular area, that's basically reinforcement learning by many users. And that's why you see a very good response. And also the quick time, right? Time is also important. Accurate and the quick. But the big data, there are three characteristics by which the big data is, uh, is virtued. So that is a vol volume, right? That is a data quantity. So because historically, what happens? What is big data actually? So historically, the, uh, if there is an uh, organization and there is an employee, employee used to generate data, right? And there was some system administrator who used to incorporate the data into his system. 
and that system was very like like the what is the age, what is the income, salary, what is the profession, and likewise. It's a very textual data, like structured data, very nice, fine. But what happens uh, after the advancement of the internet? People started generating data by themselves, like for example, WhatsApp, Facebook, Google, um, YouTube. These are the data videos generated by the users. And imagine it's not only the users, but now in the advancement of the, the mechanics, the robotics, the machine has started generating the data. In astronomy, like satellites, and then microscopy, the microscopy is generating like tons of data, right? We, we deal with that every day, right? So that is the huge data. And the, the, pro, the, the people started facing the problem how to deal with that data. And that is the whole issue of the big data, right? that you only talk about the terabytes. Forget about gigabyte. You start with the terabytes. That's a big data thing. But, uh, but So that's basically the volume, right? But it's not only the volume, it is also the velocity. The, the instant or the, uh, the rate at which the data comes to the system and needs your processing, that is also huge, right? Because you, you type your message or you try to tag somebody and that information has to go to the uh, Facebook headquarters, and that has to be updated everywhere, right? In all the machines. So that's basically the velocity, right? And then the uh, variety of the data, because it's not only uh, the textual data, but it's also the, uh, not, uh, the voice and the image and the, the, uh, the video. So these are all unstructured data, right? So these are the three uh, types of the, uh, these are the three characteristics of the big data, right? And it's not only the data that may take a small, that may be small, um, but the complicated analysis makes it big, right? In, in our case, for example, dance time and CPR, we have an image which is very small, but uh, it's that's kind of a high content, right? We want more value, we, we want more value from that data. That's also kind of a big data, right? Okay, so solution is to, in these days, is the, given by Hadoop, it's, a, it's an open source software. Right, and it's an open source platform basically, but it is not as simple as just installing on your computer and then you start uh, doing it. It's very complex, um, and there are people actually working on this particular domain. But uh, there are two uh, 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 characteristics of the Hadoop that is called as a Hadoop distributed file system and the MapReduce. So Hadoop distributed file system is that it enables the big file to store on a several machine, right? Because you must be wondering that how, how can a, a computer handle this big data, right? If the one, big, uh, one file is of the size one terabyte or one zettabyte, how can a computer handle this? Because so far, what, how we have been doing is we used to take data and go to the processor and give it to the processor, right? So we used to bring data to the processor. With this big data, which you're going to see in future, the processor comes to the data. And it's not only one processor, many processor. That's what basically cloud computing is, right? So it's a many processor, grid system, clusters, and all this grid system. So the processor used to come to the data, and they, they, what they will do, they will divide this data into small chunks, right? But there has to be some, uh, some monitor, some administrator, which will, which will know how I'm dividing that data. And that whole file system is called the distributed file system. So even if your file is one terabyte, let's say if you upload a YouTube video, right? It's not only one video that stores in a one location of the Google headquarters, right? It divides into different chunks, and one may be saved in a Palo Alto, one is saved in North Dakota, for example, right? So there is a chunks of data. And let's say if I try to write your URL of YouTube and search it, this MapReduce will query that request to the Google headquarters, and it will ask you to assemble this data from the different this thing, sources and show me a one video, right? So this is basically the whole idea of the Hadoop file, distributed file system and MapReduce. And using the MapReduce, you can also apply machine learning on the big data. Because now if you import the XLS file on which you want to apply fuzzy clustering, you have to first import it, right, on your machine. But in this case, if you use this framework, that, that XLS file or maybe whatever the table or whatever, that can be of any size and you still can apply the clustering algorithm on that. 
And it's not only one processor, but there will be many processors will be working on the same processes. And that will be done by MapReduced, okay? So this is the, the whole idea about. But this is the implication of big data and cell biology. Maybe this is interesting to you, right? Uh, there's this paper uh, in molecular biology. Uh, so here you can see there are different platforms. They are working on different aspects of the cell biology, right? So maybe it's uh, good for you to just go through. Right? But <clears throat> if time permits, I just have, we are just working on a kind of a big data, actually. I wouldn't say it's a big data, but we are kind, trying to go towards the distributed computing system, right, in CPR itself. And that's basically with the, the, the Claudius group, right? So we, we learned about the logistic regression, right? So let's say I have two plates here, and then I'm using this. This is a training phase, by the way. We have just learned this is supervised machine learning. This is uh, testing phase. With, with these two uh, plates, I'm extracting features, features like this one, cellular features. Then I'm using some quality factors, which we have used in normalization uh, lecture. And then this is a logistic regression. So I'm seeing how many sRNAs are different than the negative controls, right? And based on that, I'm building a model. This is the training phase. And I'm using that model for the test plate. And I'm getting a score for these 10 models to get, and then I'm combining that aggregates, right? But the, the, the whole point here is that the, and it's only the story of one plate, right? We have such 112 plates, and maybe many more, because it's just one replicates, right? And this itself is a four terabytes of data. And we are facing huge problem because we cannot import all the data in one processor of one MATLAB. So we are working on distributed computing system solutions. So basically, everybody has to go through this mess, right? I mean, somebody has come. I think you came to me with uh, 15 gigabytes of uh, volume, right? And the Imaris was not able to, or any software was not able to, the stitching software. So we have to find, and the so software has to think about the big data uh, implications in order to have the different image processing and image analysis. So, and I have seen, uh, actually I have showed this um, slide, but these are the book references for the entire lectures, you know, stratified by the lectures. So you can go through it, and uh, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Finally. And I hope you do not have questions. <laughs> But uh, I would like to say thank you. I may, I may not be able to, I don't know uh, when we're going to organize the, the practical classes, but thank you so much for you, for your response. I have learned a lot, you know, this, and I have, by the way, I'm recording this lecture, so it's gonna be there. So it's just that you have to understand a little bit Indian accent, right? So I hope that should be okay for you. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.